Dr. Christopher Gardner, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Simon. It's uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, you know, you know, you're a rock star in the in the nutrition science world, right? Uh, I don't know. I've been having a little bit of fun on Twitter lately, but the carnivores definitely don't like me. <laughs> well, if we get some time, we'll, we'll we'll go into that. I think people would find that interesting. Uh, I know certainly from from my perspective, I think your approach to science and communicating the science is really second to none. So. Thank you so much. I've closely followed your work and, and and I've learned a lot through it. I really have. Oh, thanks. And in fact, just to kick things off here, a little little secret. I haven't actually shared this with anyone. I think it's quite funny. Some of my friends might might be listening. And I, I love uh, a good movie or documentary or something to unwind at the end of the day, Netflix, whatever it may be. And and. I've got a bit of a reputation. People, friends will message me and say, well, what's the latest? What should I watch? And I've developed this new strategy where I'll send them one of your your lectures, one of your Stanford <laughs> talks on, on YouTube. And I tell them to, to watch that, come back to me with one key takeaway, and then I'll give you the name of a great movie to watch. And, and it, it seems to be working. <laughs> it seems to be working. Wow, and, yeah. I'm Okay. Uh, so it's definitely... It's definitely uh, hitting home with a few of my friends, that's for sure. Those lectures are brilliant. Hey, so let's let's set the scene here for for the listeners before we sort of dive into some of the really cool stuff we're going to talk about with regards to your studies. How did this career in nutrition science sort of come about for you? Am I right that it goes all the way back to you working at a cafe? It uh, actually really goes back to my philosophy degree undergrad upstate New York, uh, thought, why the hell am I in college? I should never have been in college. I need to be a bohemian and find out what's going on in life. And so I lived in a bunch of places and working in restaurants is the easiest way to do that. And along the way, there was a girl and she dumped me and she was a vegetarian. And I thought, well, maybe if I switch to a vegetarian, she'll take me back. She didn't take me back. (laughs) I liked being a vegetarian. Six years went by after college and I thought, damn, I really should do something with life. Wow, I've worked in a lot of restaurants. Maybe I should have a vegetarian restaurant. And so I actually started thinking along those lines and I thought somebody's going to make fun of my amino acids being a vegetarian. So I'm going to go to Berkeley, which is where I was at the time. And I said, can I get into the master's program here? And they said, dude, you you never took any science in college. All you took were philosophy classes. I said, yeah, it's just food. They said, oh, no, no, no. You need regular chem, biochem, organic chem, physiology, biology. I said, okay, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm an older student now. I'll take all those classes. And I took for two years. I just took makeup classes. And I actually got all A's and A pluses being an older student at this time, Simon. And so I went back with my Birkenstocks and my long hair and I said, I'm back. I took all those classes you didn't think I'd take. And they said, you're right. We didn't think you'd take them. But look, you're smarter than we thought. When you were in the philosophy program, you didn't get very good grades. But look at you as a scientist. Why don't you get a Ph.D.? And I thought, why the hell do I need a Ph.D. to open a vegetarian restaurant? But oh, (laughs) <laughs> oh, wait, I remember how great it is to be full of potential in college. People say, what are you going to be when I grow up? I don't know. I can be anything. I'm still in school. And I wanted that feeling again. So I signed up for the PhD, finished it. Uh, at that point, uh, totally confused as to what I wanted to do. I, I started thinking I'd be a teacher, but I didn't get a job. And at the last minute, with a wife and a kid in tow, I got a job as a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford University in 1993. And Simon, in my PhD program, I found in my program and in others in other universities, so much of nutrition was mechanism, rats, cells, and and not behavior. And I had actually been really interested in culture and behavior. And this group that I started the postdoc with was all about behavior. So it's in a department of medicine, There were a lot of behavioral psychologists, and so half behavioral psychologists and then half content experts. So I was a nutrition expert, there was a physical activity expert, tobacco control expert, but it was really about how do you get people to change some of their habits? And I thought, ah, this science I really like more than the rats and the cells and the mechanisms. I really want to see if I can get people to change what they're eating and stick with it. So that's a little background of 
how I got here. It was really a whole bunch of mistakes, to be perfectly honest. And so I think you, you, I guess, in nutrition science are very well known for lots of studies, but two in particular, the A to Z and, and diet fits, of course. How, how did things sort of go from that earlier stage of your career to then becoming interested in this whole uh, low-carb versus low-fat kind of conversation? And, and also, why, why the interest in, in, in weight loss out of all things that you could have gone and, and studied? What gave you that spark to want to know the effect of different diets on weight? Well, so to be honest, it definitely didn't start that way. So being a vegetarian, I was really into the different things that were in plant foods. And so there's a name in my field, phytochemicals. Phyto just means plants. So chemicals that are in plants. And that's usually typically not a vitamin or mineral. It's sort of something that doesn't have a recommended daily allowance, but might be a cool thing to eat or avoid. So I actually had a dream that my license plate was going to be Dr. Phyto. I was going to be Dr. Phytochemical. And I got NIH funding to study garlic and the allicin in it and soy and the phytoestrogen in it and ginkgo biloba. I had all these big NIH grants. And I would go and present these at meetings, Simon. I'd finish an hour-long talk and I'd say, you might have been confused, you know, if you really want me to go into the mechanism of the putative active agent, allicin and garlic, I'd be happy to expand. Yes, you in the front row, what would you like to ask? And they said, do you think you can lose more weight on Atkins or Zone? <laughs> and I looked and I said, Jesus, for the last hour, I talked about this thing that I did. And it, it happened repeatedly. And so what I got the sense of was that this is a topic that a lot of people were interested in, frustrated by. There wasn't a lot of evidence in it. And so I actually wrote up a little pilot study at the time. And that turned into one iteration after another after another. And to be honest, the A to Z study initially was supposed to be a, um, a pilot study. I wrote to the NIH for a big grant and they said, do you, you just do phytochemical stuff. You're not a weight loss person. We're not going to give you that much money. And they gave me some starter money. And then there was a very interesting court case against a weight loss drug that had gone wrong against them. And the, the money that was awarded to the court case had to go to uh, university investigators. I got a million and a half dollars from a court case that got added to the NIH funds. That was the A to Z study. That ended up being the most money I had ever received just because I sort of had something in hand when the Stanford folks came by and said, you know, there's this huge pool of money. If anybody has anything ready right now, it has to be about weight loss. You might get this. So A to Z, again, it's another mistake in my life, Simon. But great timing. Uh, in, in the A to Z, Z study, actually, let's go through what that study looked at. I know you looked at four different diets. I'm, I'm interested in, in sort of how you chose those four diets. Was that because they were the best-selling books uh, and, and sort of what the, the methodology was of that study and, and really what you learned from it that would later sort of inspire the, the next lot of research that you did. Yep. So in my field, one of the hardest things is defining a diet and getting adherence to the diet and showing that you got adherence to the diet. And this is very problematic when people say they've got a diet in mind. They've got a per certain percentage of carbs or fats in mind and they assign people to it. And this isn't for one meal. This is for months or years. And so it's really hard to do that kind of thing. So when I when I wanted to test this, I thought, you know, how is the general public doing this? They're going out and buying books. So if I just go assign some popular books, then I'll, I'll really be answering a very generalizable question. Do these books help people do it? So some people gave me a hard time saying, you know, why are you doing that? Why isn't it a sp specific proportion of fats and carbs? I said, but that's not how the public's doing it. They're going out and buying Atkins and Zone and Ornish. And that's a huge spectrum, that would make for a great comparison. And then when people say, so, you know, how do you know they were adherent? I say, well, to be honest, we got a dietitian and we had a lot of money and we got 300 women. 
And she basically read the book out loud to them once a week for eight weeks. She read like an eighth of the book. Okay, I'm being a little ridiculous. She didn't really read it out loud, but she made sure every one of them knew that the book that they got assigned had been thoroughly understood. And then very intentionally, we decided it was a one-year study. So after the eight weeks of getting this help from the dietitian and going through the book, we told them up front, we're not going to help you anymore. We want this to be a generalizable study. And once you've understood the whole book, it's up to you to follow it the best you can for a year, because that's how the American public is doing it. They're not even getting a dietitian to help them for eight weeks. And so let's just see how the cards fall when we do it that way. So it was very intentional to do it that way. And should I jump to the punchline and what happens? Yeah, I think on that, though, that point there is a key learning. I think the generalizability is something that is often overlooked when, when, particularly on Twitter, you mentioned before, when critiquing a study, you know, we, you can get people into a metabolic ward and lock them in and they're really interesting studies, but that's, that's people being fed. It's not really uh, giving insight into adherence and their behavior and what happens in the real world. Um, so that's what I love about this study is that you were very much just taking a really good look at if, if people get these books, how successful are they um, without being forced into, into eating that way? Um, okay, cool. So come to the punchline. What happened? Yeah. Well, let me just build on what you said just for a moment. So I feel like in my field, metabolic ward chamber for any of the re- listeners that aren't familiar with this, there's a guy, Kevin Hall, that I really love who does great studies. And he usually doesn't do any more than 20 people at a time because they're incarcerated. He uses the word domiciled. I think it's incarcerated. He incarcerates these people in a building. There's bars on the windows and they can't leave. And there's a chamber that they have to go into. And he can do a lot of very rigorous stuff that's not very generalizable. And then I do stuff that's very generalizable. It's not nearly as rigorous as him, but what I really like about Kevin's study is is he makes them as generalizable as possible for a rigorous, controlled, domiciled study. And I really try to make my generalizable studies as rigorous as possible. I really try to apply all the tools in science we have to define the diets well and get adherence the best we can and be taking blood samples and other factors and surveys to see who's more and less adherent. So in my as maximally rigorous as I could generalizable study, we got 300 women to be in this study for a year, and there was almost no average difference between them at the end. If there was, there was a little advantage for the group that did Atkins. They actually sort of lost more weight at the six-month mark. If you look at a graphic of what happened, the weight was actually coming back on faster for them for the other group. So by 12 months, the only actual statistically significant difference was between Atkins and Zone, which is weird. Those were the two low-carb diets. If there was really a low-carb, low-fat thing, it should have been between Ornish, which was the lowest fat, and Atkins, which was the lowest carb. And those actually weren't different. And we had a fourth diet that was more of a health professionals approach. It was called the Learn Manual by Kelly Brownell. It's really what a healthcare professional would probably use. And it was in between learn and zone in terms of fat and carbs. So on the one hand, it was it was a little disappointing that there wasn't a clear winner. On the other hand, uh, it gave me a very practical public health message. There isn't any one diet that seems to work for everybody. And so there isn't one thing that you should all try. The the mind-blowing thing for me was I had a colleague at the time, Simon, who was always pushing me to present my data in different ways. And one of them is what I call a waterfall plot. And instead of the typical thing, which is you show a bar of the average change and some magnitude of variability with what we call error bars, so why don't you just plot every damn woman on the graph, make every woman a bar and show how much weight she lost or gain, because a small proportion of them gained weight. And so what I saw from this first study was that if you looked at the pattern of weight change, which on average was only a couple kilos different for each group, on every group, somebody lost 25 or 30 kilos, somebody gained 5 or 10 kilos, and those weren't outliers. It was an absolute continuum from one end to the other. 
And so I just, oh my God, maybe what's going on here is there are certain people who should be on certain diets. And so that sort of generated the, the hypothesis. That's what I should be looking for, not for the best diet. I should be trying to look for things that would predict if you were predisposed to do better on one diet or another. That was my big takeaway from A to Z. Before we we kind of move on to, to I guess, what you then went on to look at in, in terms of trying to decipher uh, how can we predict who will be successful on, on what diet, a low carb or low fat, uh, all, all science, uh, part of science is, is being open to critique and being open to, to challenge. And am, am, am I right that Dean Ornish was a little, he was a little mad, and I guess this goes back to speaking about what we were before around adherence, he was a little, little mad with the way that the Ornish diet was adopted. He was, yeah. He said, <laughs> hey, if you look, they, they never got to 10% fat. That's my diet. And I said, I know, dude, but not only did I buy the book for them, I gave them a dietitian to read it aloud to them. So great if your book works for the people who can follow it. I found the general public can't really follow it. So, Simon, I got an even funnier comment from Barry Sears, who did the zone diet. And that was, if you look at the people who got assigned to zone, which is a 30, 30, 40, where it's 40% carb, 30 protein and 30 fat, 30 fat. They didn't um, They didn't really follow that very well when they were assigned to the zone diet. But the folks who followed Atkins also didn't follow it very well. They fell short of going low, as low in carb as Atkins said. But the people assigned to Atkins actually came out looking kind of like the zone. And so Barry Sears had this bizarre, torturous interpretation. He said, see, my diet's best. The group that lost the most weight in absolute numbers was the Atkins group. And I said, yeah, that was the Atkins group. Yeah, but they were eating pretty close to what I said they should eat. And so I said, okay, really? So to follow your diet, they should choose someone else's diet. Oh, the poor public. This is crazy. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. So, so the biggest takeaway being that there didn't seem to be too much difference between these different four diets, but within each diet, there were some people that did great and there were some people that didn't do as well. You're left thinking, well, what on earth explains this? What can what can predict success or lack of success? So you go away, uh, no doubt you're sort of scratching your head, lots of meetings with uh, colleagues, and and over a period of years, you 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 put together the diet fit study. Can you, can you walk me through this period and, and what your hypothesis was and what led you to, to dig a little deeper into this? Yeah, sure. So pretty much right after we published those main findings, I was continuing to look into this field. And the first two or three studies that I saw that were the most relevant were some of these smaller controlled feeding studies, small numbers, short amounts of time. And they were looking at this concept of insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity. And the idea for your listeners here is this is, you can have two people that look very similar. They both have similar amounts of excess adipose tissue. You know, physically they look the same. Metabolically, they were different. If you looked at their glucose, insulin, um, some of their blood chemistries, you saw that some of them are actually pretty metabolically healthy. At, an, at being, even though they were overweight. And some, even though they weren't all that overweight, were metabolically unhealthy. And one of the common themes that was coming up at the time, which is quite popular now, but it was kind of new at that time, was this idea of insulin resistance, which meant that on a standard low-fat diet, which was the existing paradigm for decades um, before the millennium turned over there, a low-fat diet is a high carb diet. And people who are insulin resistant, the idea here is you have consumed some carbs, your blood glucose goes up, your pancreas senses this, it produces a bunch of insulin, which is designed to get the glucose out of your blood and put it away. And people who are insulin resistant, the glucose doesn't actually get put away as efficiently as it should be. And the pancreas senses that and says, huh, guess I didn't make enough insulin, I'll make some more and some more, and some more. And so we have a huge population in the U.S. anyway of people who have prediabetes, 
They actually, their glucose level doesn't qualify for them for being in the diabetic range. But if you were to measure their insulin, which I don't know if you know this, it's not a standard clinical measure. Glucose is, cholesterol is, insulin, I think it will be someday soon, but it's not a standard clinical measure. If you look at that for those people, it is sky high. And so really what's happening in those people who are not yet diabetic is they are borderline diabetic because their pancreas is working its tail off to make enough insulin to get that glucose put away. And their bodies are flooded with extra insulin, which does different things about how much fat you're storing and how much you're releasing and what you're... Anyway, it's not good. It's metabolically unhealthy. And that was my first clue to see these three papers that said, hey, if you split people into who is the most insulin sensitive, which is healthy, and insulin resistance, which is metabolically unhealthy, wow, those insulin resistant people really shouldn't be on a standard low fat diet because it's high carb. They have a hard time putting carb away. And so I thought, ah, that is a brilliant insight. I wonder if that's one of the things that could have predicted this variability within the diets. Um, Let's go back and look at our old paper from A to Z, our old data. And we had a very crude measure. We only had fasting insulin, which is not a very good measure, just what they've taken in the morning after an overnight fast. And we did a little paper. And when we picked Atkins and Ornish as the low carb and the low fat groups, and we looked at who had higher and lower fasting insulin in the morning, it was significantly different. And the ones who were the most insulin resistant who got assigned to Ornish, had, a, had the worst time following it. They reported not being very adherent. And this is funny to me because we didn't tell them what their fasting insulin was. Everybody just got assigned or a quarter of the women just got assigned to the Ornish diet. And I said, ah, they didn't even know this. And somehow metabolically, something's making it hard for them to follow it. And maybe that's why they're not losing weight. Okay, so I'm gonna try to do a new study and there's better ways to do it. There's something called an oral glucose tolerance test. So you have to come in in the morning, you're fasted again, haven't eaten anything for 12 hours, and you have to drink this glop. You have to drink 75 grams of glucose in a lemon or orange flavored thing that's really disgusting because it's solid glucose. Now, I don't know if glucose sounds sugary to your listeners, but things that are sweet have sucrose in them that's half glucose and half fructose, and it's the fructose that's sweeter than the glucose. If you have to drink, I don't know if any of, you, any of your listeners have um, tried corn syrup. So try dipping your finger in corn syrup if you're ever baking it. And to, it is like cloyingly, disgustingly sweet. And on an empty stomach, it flies into your bloodstream. And so what you do in this test is you give them 75 grams of glucose and you measure their blood insulin and glucose just before you give them the drink. And then at 30, 60, and 120 minutes later. And when we did that with a practice group of 60 people, we saw a 40-fold range of difference in how much insulin they made to that same 75 grams of glucose. And they were all roughly in the body mass index, index range of 28 to 40. So they were all overweight or obese, but no one was morbidly obese. No one was thin. So they, they looked kind of comparable. Oh my gosh, massive changes in uh, this insulin resistance idea. So that was the fun thing that I wanted to follow up on. And Simon, I wrote that grant three or four times and none of them got funded. This is maybe a fun insider part of the story here. The reviewers kept writing back, and kept saying, ah, you're measuring this insulin resistance thing the wrong way. And I kept turning the pages, waiting for them to say the right way to measure it is, and they never did. Bastards, they like told me I was doing it wrong, and then they, they didn't offer me the right way to do it. And really what I come to understand is there's a whole lot of ways to measure insulin resistance and sensitivity, and the best ones are prohibitive. There's a famous guy at uh, Stanford that died recently, Jerry Reven. He used to hook people up with an IV in both arms for eight hours to figure it out. <laughs> that You cannot do that to the average person. And so... I just kept biting the bullet and saying, okay, look, there isn't a perfect measure of insulin resistance and sensitivity. It's a continuum from one end to the other. This is how we're going to measure it. And they didn't, they didn't fund it. I rewrote it. They didn't fund it. Just about this time, Simon, somebody else just came out of left field and said, wow, 
we think we have a key to this whole thing. We think people are genetically predisposed. So there's this other side of life with something called single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs for short. They are just single um, amino acid type uh, or single base pair substitutions in your DNA. And they can change the function of, for example, an enzyme that might metabolize carbohydrate or fat. And they had looked through all this growing field of SNPs and said, we have identified three that we think are involved in carbohydrate fat metabolism, have at least one paper published on them, and mechanistically would make sense that we could predict which direction it's going to go. Could we go back to your A to Z data and could we see if this would predict differential weight loss? I said, ah, I never collected any DNA, but we wrote to all the women and we got, of the 300, we had about 140 respond. We sent them a cheek swab kit. They got their DNA by doing the cheek swab. So we kind of retroactively went back and not all the data worked. So only 120 of it was clean. And of the sort of the, uh, they're called genotype patterns. So a low fat genotype pattern was about 40% of the population a low carb genotype pattern was 40% and 20 were neither. There was 20 that it didn't really seem to go one way or the other. So it went from 140 to 120 and of the 120, 20% didn't count. And then I've got four diets. And so the numbers start getting really small here as I'm starting to look at who I have data for. But in this very small set of data, it was fascinating. It totally looked like it worked. So I went to the American Heart Association meeting I presented these data, I resubmitted my grant, and I said, not just insulin resistance, we're gonna look at two things at once. We're gonna look at that and genotype pattern predisposition, and boom, I finally got funded after multiple rejections. There you go, it was the the genotype that got you over the line. The, just to just to clarify on in case some of the listeners are, are hearing that for the first time, what your predicting or were predicting here is that some individuals may have a genetic predisposition to doing better on low fat and then some with a different genetic predisposition could do better on low carb. Perfect. And you were wanting to then run another study with more people, more DNA samples, more uh, genetic information to determine if that was the case, to answer that question. And to do the right insulin resistance test that would be more sensitive than the one I did before. And so this time got funding for 600 people, double the other size of the study, this time men and women. And we actually had what's called statistical power to be testing really two things in one study, the genotype pattern predisposition and the insulin resistance versus sensitivity predisposition. Okay, so this study, like the A to Z, is a randomized controlled trial. That's what you like to, to do, yep. which is high quality, high quality science. Twelve uh, month trial again. Walk. Can you before we walk through the results? Can we go through a little about the methodology? Because I know that you paid particular attention to making sure that the diet quality was was emphasized, and that was something that was really important to you. Can you? explain why that was important and sort of how you went about ensuring subjects did understand what a high uh, high quality diet looked like. Yep. And and let me start that up. Before the high quality, let's talk about how low is low carb and how low is low fat. I mean, we were going with the assumption here that certain people wouldn't be able to get as low and keep their diet as low in carb or fat because they were predisposed. It wouldn't be a willpower issue. It wouldn't be a test of personal integrity. It would be some metabolic thing just saying, okay, look, human body, you are trying to avoid all this stuff and it is not working. Whereas somebody else, it might be just easy. It might, oh my God, this is, I, I didn't realize how easy it was to cut all this out because we had heard that anecdotally many times before. I bet many of your listeners know somebody who's lost a lot of weight And somebody tried to do the exact same thing, and it didn't work. So we didn't want to penalize people for not hitting 20% fat or 20% carb. So, Simon, we actually tested this 
in a study that we published before Diet Fits. And the study was really designed just to test an approach to doing this. And I was pretty sure I would get pushed back from my colleagues because it wasn't clean and clear. It wasn't 20% of this and 30% of that. And we have a really horrible name that I love, and it's called Limbo Titrate Quality. And so the Limbo Titrate Quality method was, as they joined the study, we said, you have eight weeks. You're either just going to get, not four diets this time, just two, low carb or low fat. We want you, whichever one you're on, to get down to 20 grams of carbs or 20 grams of fat in the first eight weeks. And people eat about 300 grams of carbs a day, and they might eat 90 or 100 grams of fat a day. And getting to 20 means you are excluding many of the things that you are accustomed to eating, right? So That's first, hard work. It's hard work. And another thing that we were very interested in is doing something generalizable, as you pointed out before. We were hopeful that if, one of, if we found diets that worked for specific people but not others, that when the study was over, they would be able to continue that diet. I didn't want a diet that would only work during the research portion. So we said, we want you to lower your carbs and fats, carbs or fats, to 20 grams a day for the first eight weeks. And then once you get there, and you don't all have to get there at the same time, some of you type double A's will get there faster, and some of you type B personality folks will get there slower. Why don't you try to stick there for a couple weeks and anchor yourself psychologically low and say, yep, I'm going to do this. I'm really going to wipe out that many carbs and fats from my diet. But honestly... At that level, you have to exclude so many foods to get that low on either end. There's some nutrients that are hard to get um, in, the, in a balance of nutrients. So I said, we, we actually don't think it's healthy to stay that low forever, but we do want to psychologically anchor you that low. And then we'd be willing to allow you to titrate back up. So up until month three or month six, go ahead and try adding another five grams a day in for a week or two. How are you doing? Are you still, ah, you're still feeling that this is punitive. It doesn't work in your social life. Well, then it's not going to work for real. Okay, add another five or 10 grams back. Add another five or 10 grams back. And this titrate concept was such that if you got high enough, that it seems like you overdid it and the weight is coming back on and you're disappointed and you want to go back, you could go back down again. We weren't holding you to that higher level every week. You were supposed to drip, 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 titrate this to a point that you thought you could maintain and then go back down again if you could and find that lowest possible level of carb or fat that you could do and look us in the eye and say, yeah, I think when the study's over, if this thing works for me, I'm going to keep doing this because I can do this socially. I can find the foods. It's practical, culturally appropriate for me. And then the third component, which was one of my favorites, was quality. We said, okay, you can't game the system. I've done this before. I know some of you are going to go to the store and say, oh, I'm in this new Stanford study and I found the brownies, the potato chips, and the candies that all say low fat or low carb on them. So I'm going to eat those. No, 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 no. You're supposed to eat vegetables every day, no matter which group you're in. Vegetables don't have that many calories. Sure, they have lots of carbs, but they don't actually have that many calories. So even the low carb folks can have broccoli and cauliflower and lettuce and red bell peppers. But we really want you to choose quality foods. And we've got a dietitian assigned to you for the entire year. Actually, we had five dietitians assigned to them. And Simon, this is kind of fun from the point of study design and implementation. We had five excellent dietitians and every one of them had to teach at the same time as we went through the study for several years, a low carb and a low fat class. They both taught both classes. And we said, and, and I, we want you to be proud of what you're teaching these people. We don't want to feel, we don't want you to feel like you've compromised yourself. Oh, I have a favorite diet here. And, oh, I'm sorry, you got the shitty diet. And so uh, I feel really bad you got that one. And I got to tell, no, we wanted them to say, if you're going to do this, we want to do this the best, healthiest way possible. And they, a, a fun thing, just to tell you from our staff meetings every week, were they had predisposed ideas of what they thought was better. And we blew their predisposed ideas away. Like they did have a favorite, But they saw people on both 
types of diets thriving and both types of diets failing. And they were doing their best. So I think that's a good point. Diet fits itself, would you say, the, the, the primary rationale for the study wasn't to see if low carb was better than low fat, but was more about seeing within each of those groups, back to that, what you said before, the genotype and the insulin resistance, do they explain success or lack of success? Exactly, yeah. So nowhere in the hypothesis was there that low carb or low fat would do better. That wasn't, and in fact, sort of an expected thing was, if we did them both as healthfully as possible, they would come out almost even on average. But what we were counting on was a huge range of variability. And so actually, as the study was going, we could keep track of average weight loss. And a lot of people lost a lot of weight and the average looked the same. And if, if you are familiar with this, we were blinded to the study results, but that didn't unblind us. That was never our hypothesis. The hypothesis came when we revealed who was insulin resistant or sensitive and when we revealed who had a low carb or a low fat genotype pattern. So in this study, was was the the variation in in weight loss within each group, was it widespread like the A to Z study? And did was it explained by the the genotype and and uh, insulin resistance? So it, the variance was just as high as we had expected. Once again. A bunch of people lost 25 and 30 kilos. A bunch of people gained 5 and 10 kilos. Everything in between. Huge drum roll. The insulin resistance didn't work. And the genotype pattern didn't work. Neither of them predicted the, the massive variability that we saw. This is like 10 years of my life. And I was like, it, oh, this hypothesis makes so much sense. <laughs> And it failed. Were you were you deflated, or did that was that a success to you because it kind of ticks those off and then sets you on a, on a new direction for looking at? Well, hang on, if it's not these these three SNPs and it's not insulin resistance, then what is it? Is it behavior? Is it hunger drive? Like what what can explain why some people are doing well on on a particular diet and others are not? Yeah, so it definitely was deflating for the first moment. But throughout the study, we were all super proud of what we were doing for how many people we retained in the study, for how well they were trying to follow with the dietitians. We're all really proud of the participants themselves. They could see how hard they were working at this. We were really collecting lots of data to be able to explore different alternatives. So uh, I wasn't really actually all that keen on the genotype thing. I know that pushed me over the line for getting funded. But there's about 100 different SNPs that are related to weight. And we only had three in a very specific pattern. So there were really, we didn't test, we didn't test genotype. We tested these two specific genotype patterns. There are hundreds of other potential patterns that could be looked at. So I thought that was a far cry. But I had really been convinced by this metabolic data about the insulin resistance and sensitivity thing of which people were writing, yes, but they're small and short studies. Somebody should do a larger, longer study. I thought, this is great. I'll be able to nail this one because it's long enough and large enough, and I have all the measures I need this time. Nobody's going to question us. So when it didn't work, yes, I was deflated for a moment, but then I thought, you know, one of the things that we are super proud of was that we focused on this high-quality aspect. So we didn't set one up to be the straw man to be knocked over. Maybe if you're choosing a high quality, low carb and a high quality, low fat, whether you're insulin resistant or sensitive or not doesn't matter. And that actually, you know, from another angle can be helpful to people. Oh my God, I found out I'm insulin resistant, except I hate eating this, but apparently I'm supposed to. No, actually, if you choose a high quality diet, then you could lose weight on both of them. And so that was actually the practical message that I came away with. I got a couple other hypotheses, but sort of the public health facing message was, we did this, other people have reported it's different. We, because our results are, are larger and longer than some of the other ones, we, we're not inclined to say, oh, they were right and we're wrong, we did it wrong. 
We're inclined to say maybe some of the other diets weren't done with enough attention to quality. So maybe, and this is true in my field, people are definitely biased to what they think will work. And you can set these things up so that your favorite diet is is sort of set up to have a higher chance of success. And maybe, maybe that's what was going on in some of the smaller, shorter studies. In in your study, and I'm just thinking out loud here, so I could be completely going down the wrong path. But if so, you've got this widespread, and let's just take the 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 low fat group, for example, but I could be talking about either. And within that group, you've got people who are really successful and people who are not. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming the people who were successful were consuming less calories per day on average than those who were not successful. And I'm wondering, was did you did you pick up on satiety or people that were successful sort of uh, feeling, feeling fuller on, on less calories? So a real challenge in my field, Simon, is getting people to accurately reflect their calories. That's where Kevin Hall whoops my butt all the time because he cooks it for them and slides it under the cage door and has them eat it and measures everything they didn't eat. So people are notoriously inaccurate in reporting what they're eating. Um, When we looked at calorie level for weight loss, it wasn't related to weight loss. Wow. Right? And it's like, oh my, but energy in, energy out. Now, that could be because that's wrong and the laws of thermodynamics are wrong, or it just could be, there's a lot of noise when people are doing this. So imagine this, somebody's on the diet for 12 months. We don't check their diet every day. We ask them on three days at the beginning, three days at three months, three days at six months, and three days at 12 months. If you look at people just for those three days, the typical variability from one day to the next is 500 calories. You get somebody eating 1,500 calories one day, 2,000 calories the next day, and 1,250 the next day. And you come up with one average and you say, ah, that's what they were eating in July. This is not really what they were eating in July. That's what they were eating the three days we asked them. So I'm not sure if the, I, I believe the calories made a difference. We couldn't pick it up in the assessment they were doing, but I love your insight. So can I build on the satiety insight for a minute? Yeah, let's build on that because I know anecdotally, you know, I kind of, I listen to all sides of this diet wars and there are people who swear that on a high fat diet, they're satiated. And then there's someone else who's like, well, when I eat lots of starchy foods, beans and rice, I'm right. I'm full and I eat less overall. So, um, you know, I'm just wondering whether you think that plays a role. Yeah. So there's a, I have a slide from many years back that says protein is more satiating than carbs or more satiating than fat. And to me, that's, that's a ridiculous statement because maybe that's if you ate pure protein, pure fat and pure carbs. When you're eating a mixed meal that has carbs and fats and protein. Um, yes, there's a, there is a satiety factor with protein, but carbs have fiber and carbs have a lot of water. And wa- the, wa- the bulk of the water is satiating and the bulk of the fiber is satiating. Fat delays gastric emptying. It takes longer to get it out of your stomach. That is satiating. So I, I really don't think it's fair to say there's an order to the macronutrients. I think it's the types of proteins, carbs, and fats that you eat. So, Simon, in the middle of my study, a group of three organizations, the American Cardiology Association and the Obesity Society and the American Heart Association, came out with this big thing about weight management. And there was a huge section on diet. And so we're going to summarize all the weight loss diets that there are. And they summarized about 20 different kinds of diets. And they said, our opinion is that you can lose weight on any of the 20 diets, but there isn't one diet that works for everybody. And it does appear that for all of these, the thing that's critical is restricting your calories. But we did notice in the different studies that we looked at that there's two types. There's one with a prescribed energy restriction and one with an achieved energy restriction. Okay, I'm gonna stop and see if this makes sense. So prescribed energy restriction would have been, okay, hello, Mrs. X and Mr. Y, you've come in today, and it looks like you need some weight, lose some weight. 
And we have this archaic mathematical thing that a pound of body fat is worth 3,500 calories, and you're going to have to have a deficit of 3,500 calories to lose that pound of fat. And interestingly, that works really well into seven days of the week. If you divide 3,500 by seven days, you need a 500 calorie deficit um, per day to lose one pound of fat. And you might think you need to lose 50 pounds of fat. Okay, so think about that. 50 weeks of the year, and you let's say you usually eat 2,500 calories a day, you need to eat one-fifth less every day for the year. And the first thing in their mind is like, crap, that sucks. That sounds like I'm going to be hungry forever. I mean, I was eating till I was full. And now you want me to eat one-fifth less every single day. Oh, no, actually, I'd like to lose two pounds of fat a day. Oh, well, then you have to have a thousand calorie restriction every day of the week per pound. Oh, my God, that, that is so punitive that people freak out and they... They can't do it. So the other thing that I liked was an achieved calorie restriction because in Diet Fits, we never told anybody about, we never talked about calories. We did not say, you need to achieve this. We said, this is a low fat, low carb diet. I want you to go as low as you can in carb or as low as you can in fat. And we don't want you to be hungry because if you're hungry, we know you can't sustain that. So you need to work that to the lowest carb or fat you can be with high quality foods where you aren't hungry. And collectively, they lost more than 6,500 pounds. And we never gave them a prescribed calorie restriction. And what the dietitians were telling me is exactly what you were saying, is that some people were very satiated eating fewer calories on low carb, while others were not. And some were very satiated on low fat and others were not. And that's too general of a statement to make because there were different ways, there's different ways to eat low carb and low fat. You can choose different foods. But if I walked away with any follow up that I haven't quite got funded yet, it would be to personalize satiety. It would be try different breakfasts and lunches and mixtures of food and maybe eating something first and something second. What kind of approaches can you personalize your own satiety so that you make these choices and you're full, you're satiated. And then then you get rid of this punitive aspect of the weight loss diet and you are enjoying the foods that you're eating and you're not hungry. I think that's the silver bullet for me. Okay, so so the diet fits, I guess, overall conclusion that that achieved calorie de- de- uh, deficit or, or achieved weight loss, I should say, um, that that you saw with diet fits was a result not of saying, "Hey, cut your calories to this," but really just moving people to a higher quality diet. And then you know what what you're talking about here is then does does satiety explain the differences between the groups and and perhaps there's room for people to explore which variation low carb high carb seems to fill them up with fewer calories you mentioned personalized nutrition i got a question on that seems to be a bit of a buzzword at the moment and and there's lots of people uh, talking about it and, and it sounds all very exciting and it kind of gets me thinking about the microbiome. Have you thought about microbiome differences between subjects? Does Would that possibly predict how someone would go on a, on a different diet? And what do you think about sort of personalized nutrition and the movement and, and all of the sort of testing kits and stuff that are popping up? Yep. So I'm actually very heavily involved with two groups right now. And one is my microbiologist colleague at Stanford, Justin Sonnenberg, and his wife, Erica Sonnenberg. So, Simon, I used to call myself a feeder and a bleeder. So they say, what do you do for a living? Well, I feed and bleed people. You know, I'd get them to eat different food, and then i take their blood, and i look what happened to it. Now, we always take their poop. Everybody gives us their poop. Um, I really thought this would be prohibitive. We actually did this in the middle of Diet Fits. We started doing this. Justin Sonnenberg approached me and said, Can, I'd really love to play with some of this data. Do you think your participants would be willing to do that? Said, no, poop is icky. Oh my God, we're harassing them with surveys. We're sticking them with needles. All right, you're a nice guy. I'll ask him if anybody's willing to do it, but I got to tell him it's optional because we're already doing a lot of stuff to him. 
And I said, okay, people, I got this colleague here. He's willing to look at the microbiome and tell you what he can about it, but we really don't know everything yet. So I'm not sure what he's going to tell you. 80% of the participants gave us their poop. 80%. Wow. I didn't even tell them what I could tell them. It was just such a buzzword, the prebiotic and the probiotic thing. So we actually have a very cool paper coming out on July 6th on the microbiome. And I can give you a hint of what it is. We've got 18 people. It was a pilot study to go from 20 grams of fiber a day to 40 grams of fiber a day. And from less than one serving a day of fermented food to six servings a day of fermented food. Now, those are small servings of fermented food, like a bottle of kombucha is two servings. Half a cup of yogurt is one serving. Half a cup of sauerkraut or kimchi is one serving. Okay, and so we characterize changes in microbiome changes in immune function. It wasn't a calorie weight loss study. It was very much an immune function study. But we have documented in this field of prebiotics and probiotics, we found some fascinating individual differences, some of which appear, it's a small early study, appear to have been dictated, dictated by what their microbial diversity was to begin with. So Justin has a whole bunch of data from traditional hunter-gatherer um, populations, that, uh, the few that are left in the world, and their microbial profile is completely different than the Western world. There's species that have gone extinct that don't exist anymore. So he and I are looking at that. So we have a very fun paper coming out in two weeks. I started tweeting about it last Saturday just to tease everybody and get them excited about this new study that I can't reveal yet because it will break the embargo. But I'll bring up another study in the UK, um, the PREDICT group that works with a for-profit company called Zoe. And I'm on their scientific advisory board. And we meet, uh, I met this morning with them. We meet every other week. They have two papers published in Nature Medicine. And they started with a thousand twins in the UK. And so they had monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And they were trying to look at a lot of their focus is this new thing with continuous glucose monitors and seeing how much glucose changes in response to the diet, the foods you're eating. And they were able to calculate uh, not only the food that they were eating, but their genetics, their epigenetics, their microbiome, their sleep patterns, their physical activity. And so in one of these two papers, Simon, they say, OK, I can't remember the exact numbers. 6% of the difference is due to the genome, and 7% is due to sleep, and 8% is due to the microbiome, and 4% is due to physical activity. So they sort of tried to parse out all these things that have a difference on how different people respond to the same glucose source and load based on all these other parameters. So that was the first paper. And in the second paper that came out shortly after that, they did a deep dive into the microbiome. They looked at hundreds of different species and they showed different species that correlated well with good metabolic profile, bad metabolic profile, good glucose response, bad glucose response. And so, yes, I'm very much into the microbiome. I will say that in that field of personalized nutrition, there is a problem. We've had multiple companies start up and go out of business already because they're ahead of the science. They're saying, they've been making promises of, we, if you just send us your poop, we'll tell you what you need to do. That we don't know yet. But yes, I am really excited about the potential of the microbiome, but I'm actually a little terrified of the people who are making claims that go beyond the, beyond the science that we have already, because we're not there yet. Okay, well, it's a good learning for the listeners just to be cautious of hype until the science catches up and to, to make sure you're, you're going to trusted sources. Uh, and with that study coming out, perhaps you can come back on and you can, you can share the results with us at, at some stage in the future. We're, we're sort of wrapping up here. I'm conscious of time, but I, I have a couple other questions uh, for you before we do finish up. One is uh, to do with the, the sort of carbohydrate insulin model. And that, that's been put forward by Carrie Gary Taubes and, and, and others, uh, this, is, this idea that carbohydrates raises insulin, leads to fat storage, uh, less energy, increased hunger. Is there, 
Is there much to this model that remains unanswered or, or would you say that it's now been refuted by science? Yeah, I'm not in favor of the model. So of all the science that's come out, I think actually David Ludwig does an elegant job of isolating this in some of his studies. They're very contrived. They're very controlled. And he can pick up a signal in that kind of study. He and I actually presented together at a conference, and his conclusion seemed to be that because that model works, then some people would do better on low carbon, some people would do better on low fat. And I said, but I I just did that 600-person study, and it didn't matter. Like, I... I know you're saying this works in this very controlled condition, but if it's going to be useful to people, then it should work in the general public. And I didn't do a study as controlled as you did. I did this big 600-person, one-year study. It should have showed up. If it was important, I can measure a lot of the things that you're measuring. Not as well, but in a general way. If this had, if this had been substantive, I think we could find it, and we couldn't find it. Okay, so... To, to wrap this one up, some takeaway messages from Professor Christopher Gardner, who's done multiple very well-known studies. We've spoken about them here, and, and you're across all of the, the literature, work from Kevin Hall, et cetera. What, what can we confidently say today? We, we know about nutrition and obesity. What, what do we still need to go out and explore? And if someone's listening right now just as an individual – where where should they start in terms of of better navigating their food choices for for weight loss and for overall health? Yeah. So the, what I've come to, I actually just had to do this. They invited me to give an invited lecture for the American Heart Association just before the pandemic hit, and I was trying to put all that together. And so I said, I I really think at some level there is a foundational diet. I can even get two extremes like low fat vegan and ketogenic to agree on at least four or five things, okay? Less added sugar, less refined grain, lots of vegetables, non-starchy vegetables. So the broccolis, the red bell peppers, the snap peas, the things like that, okay? Overall, more whole foods and less processed food, particularly if you want to call them ultra-processed. That is like, nothing's more contentious than low-fat vegan and ketogenic. And you can get them to agree on that. So, and... In the U.S., I don't know about in Australia, but in the U.S., we suck at doing that. We don't eat many vegetables. We eat a crap load of sugar and refined grain. We eat a lot of ultra-processed food and very few whole foods. I think that's 50% of the metabolic and the health issues of the planet. And if everybody's agreeing on that, why aren't we focusing on the things that we agree on? And then after that, I draw this picture of concentric circles and say, look, Okay, you might not get all the keto and the low-fat vegan folks on board, but I think we should have healthy fats, avocados, nuts, seeds, oils. I think we should have beans. I think we should have fruits. Um, I'm I'm even down for fish and uh, eggs, even though I'm a vegan myself. Most nutrition professionals agree on all five of those. And then I think if you went to types of whole grains and types of poultry, you'd still get people to agree, okay, Kentucky Fried Chicken, not so good. How about a pasture-raised chicken? Better. Whole, intact quinoa and steel-cut oats? Great. Refined grain? Not so good. I actually think there's a huge foundational stuff, area of foundational diet that everybody would agree on, or almost everybody. And then, after that, if, if you got that right, and for most people, that would be a big shift. I don't know if you would agree in Australia, but if you did those things. Absolutely. Here in Australia is not much different. 95% of Australians are not eating enough fruit and veg, and 42% of calories come from ultra-processed foods. So what I'd like to see is people do that and then mess with their personalization. Okay, now I'm really more of a low-carber or a low-fatter or a higher protein, and when I do it, I'm going to do it with whole foods. I'm going to do it with... Food's caught the right way. I'm going to take the environment into account. I'm going to take animal rights and welfare into account because it can all fit nicely together. It could be consistent with my personal values, my cultural tastes, et cetera. So I really think there's room for personalization. I really think the microbiome is going to be cool. But I don't, I'm very frustrated with like all this focus on the periphery 
when the stuff in the center that so many people agree on seems to get passed by the wayside. Oh, I'm still waiting for the person to tell me that green jelly beans, that I, I'm genetically predisposed to do well with green jelly. No, no one's ever going to tell you you're going to do well with green jelly beans. Get the foundational <laughs> diet right and then play with some of the other things. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost as if the conversation moves to the periphery because that's where it's a bit sexier to debate yeah. plant versus animal versus the the middle the middle chunk that you're talking about, which is the lowest hanging fruit, is the biggest lever to pull. Yeah, is it's it's not as appealing to to, to keep you know harping on about. Uh, that brings me to my final sort of question here is around obesity uh, overall, and and speaking, I guess zooming back out and not speaking so much on the individual level, uh, if, if you could sort of wave your wand and, and tomorrow the food environment globally changed, would, would based on what you just said then, I'm, I'm assuming that it would, it would just change the, the availability of certain foods and, and make ultra-processed foods, sort of takeaway foods, less available? Yep. It would change the types of food we grow, more plants, less animal, more vegetables. And a huge piece of that is actually the fun I'm having with chefs now. So, Simon, in the U.S., half the food that people uh, consume here is eaten outside of the home, prepared by somebody else. Getting chefs on board because they can make this stuff taste great. They can make a fabulous bean and rice dish that's Moroccan spiced and seared vegetables on top and maybe not a huge amount of meat, but two ounce strips of meat or fish or chicken or something like that. I think the key is making it tasty, uh, accessible, appropriately, uh, you know, cost within the, the cost range of some people. Those are the bigger challenges actually beyond this low carb, low fat protein thing. So it's a food, I'm glad you ended on this. It's a food systems issue. And so we need, there's a lot of players who could come in and help us with taste, cost, convenience, access. And then I'll back them up with metabolism someday. <laughs> that's a great point. We can't, we can't lose the satisfaction for food and that's, that's integral to building new habits, right? Don't lose the joy and the pleasure. When I gave that talk at the AHA, my last statement was, don't forget, there's so much joy and pleasure in food. And if you're going to leave that out, we are not going to get behavior change. We're not going to get meaningful behavior change. And we don't have to. We can do it. Well said. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gardner. Big pleasure having you on the show and some some real incredible takeaways for everyone here. So thank you. Keep up the great work. And as I said, I'd, I'd love to have you back on the show sometime in the future. Fun conversation. You ask good questions. So I'd be happy to be back, Simon. Fun to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs>